The Z-transform includes the discrete time Fourier transform, of course, as a special case. So we would expect that the properties of the Z-transform should be very similar to some of the properties of the discrete time Fourier transform. And that's indeed the case. The linearity property, which we've already used in doing partial fraction expansions and things like that, where if I have a signal A times X1 of N plus B times X2 of N, and I take the Z-transform of that signal, I get A times X1 of Z plus B times X2 of Z. And the region of convergence for the sum is the intersection of the region of convergences for the individual signals x1 and x2. The convolution property is also similar to the discrete time Fourier transform in that if I have a convolution of x1 and x2, the z-transform is just the product of the z-transforms of the individual signals. So the z-transform also converts convolution in the time domain to multiplication in the z domain. The region of convergence again involves the intersection of the two z transforms because for this product to be defined the z transforms have to exist at values of z corresponding to both functions. Well this convolution property leads us to an interpretation of the z transform in terms of systems. If I have a input x of n to a linear time invariant system with the impulse response h of n, then of course my output is y of n as the convolution of x with h. So if I take these signals into the z domain and take a z transform, I have x of z, and then my impulse response converts to h of z, and we see that y of z is the product x of z times h of z. And h of z is known as the system function or the transfer function of the system. It's the z-transform of the impulse response. A third property that we're going to look at is differentiation of x of z. And in this case, if we multiply x of n by n, in other words, multiply by time here, what happens in the z domain is we have negative z times the derivative of x of z with respect to z. So this leads us to example for a signal which sometimes comes up and that is if we have n times a to the n u of n, the z transform is easily obtained by first differentiating the z transform of a to the n u of n and then multiplying by negative z. And if you do that you find that the z transform of n a to the n u of n is a z inverse over 1 minus a z inverse squared. The region of convergence is magnitude of z greater than the magnitude of a. A fourth property that we're going to consider is multiplication by an exponential sequence. And what we mean is if we take some constant complex number z naught and we raise it to the nth power and multiply that by x of n. So z naught to the nth power is an exponential and if we take the z transform it turns out that this takes the z-transform of x and scales z. So instead of x of z, we have x of z divided by z naught. And the ROC also scales. If we had an ROC r sub x, then the new ROC will be the magnitude of z naught times r sub x. This implies that if x of z has a pole or a zero at some location alpha, then x of z over z naught has a pole or a zero at z naught times alpha. So when we multiply by an exponential sequence, we're shifting the locations of poles and zeros by a factor z naught. We can expand z naught in polar form as magnitude r and a phase e to the j phi. And that implies that when I do this multiplication, z naught alpha, my new pole has magnitude r times the magnitude of the original pole. So if r is greater than 1, I move the pole further away from the origin. If r is less than 1, I shrink the pole toward the origin. And then the phase of alpha gets shifted by phi. So I also rotate the pole by an angle phi when I multiply this way. The last property that we're going to consider is the time shift property. And that says that if I take x and I shift it by n naught samples, that's equivalent to multiplying in the z domain by 
z to the negative n naught. And the ROC remains the same except possibly at z equals zero or z equals infinity. To give you an idea where that comes from, let's say I have a sequence which has zero for all positive values of n. Well, that sequence could include z equals zero in its region of convergence because it doesn't have any powers of z that are negative. It doesn't involve z inverse at all. Well, if I take that sequence, which is left-sided, and I shift it to the right, now I'm going to involve some data at, at times corresponding to negative powers of z. So I'm going to have, say, for example, z to the minus 1. Well, in that case, z equals 0 then has to be ruled out because it wouldn't converge at that point. We can do some interesting things with the time shift property and systems, and in particular, we're going to look at a system described by a difference equation. So we can relate the input to a system, x of n, to the output through a difference equation. And this particular one has linear constant coefficients. And if I write this in the general form, the sum k equals 0 to n, ak, y of n minus k, is equal to the sum k equals 0 to m, bk, x of n minus k. Difference equations are widely used in signal processing because they are very simple to implement and allow us to compute outputs y for inputs x without having to necessarily use a very long convolution. So we're going to take the z transform of both sides of this equation. And if we use the time shift property, then y of n minus k has z transform z to the minus k, y of z. Similarly, x of n minus k has z transform z to the minus k, x of z. Well, at this point, I can do some algebra to isolate y of z and write that y of z is equal to this ratio, the sum k equals 0 to m, bk, z to the minus k, divided by the sum k equals 0 to n, a k, z to the minus k times x of z. I can interpret this as h of z, the system or transfer function, where I am observing the output y of z is just the product of the z transform of the impulse response times the input z transform. In this case, we see that for a system described by a difference equation, the z transform of the impulse response takes the form of this rational function that involves the coefficients bk and the recursive coefficients ak. So this is one of the reasons why this particular form for a z transform, which we've looked at in the context of poles and zeros and partial fraction expansions, why this particular form is so useful, because it represents the system or transfer function for a system described by a difference equation. Now there are other z transform properties besides the five that we've discussed here in this lecture, but these are some of the more important ones that we'll use in our work in signal processing.